What is going on, YouTube? It's Pete coming in hot with another video. Also known as that guy, Pete, you refuse to invite to gatherings. And today, mentioned it briefly in passing at the end of yesterday's video. When you are operating in the manosphere space, right? And you're consuming red pill ideas, you're consuming black pill ideas, consuming white pill ideas, pink pill ideas if you're women who believe you are themselves, or any of the other pills out there, stuck in purple, gray, and crimson limbo. You're an MRA, a MGTOW, a PUA, maybe you're just a Fabstronaut trying to improve your life. Whatever it is, in so. One of the most important things is to always go and examine where the ideas are being challenged to see if there are any points being made and um, if there are some flaws or misunderstandings on the other side of um, what um, the other side is saying about you. If there's misunderstandings on terms of how they interpret what it is your intentions are. So to that end, I'm here to talk about the book, Not All Dead White Men, um, written by Donna Zuckerberg. She's a uh, staunch feminist. Okay. And she is also a classicist, which means uh, if you ever been to college and you took the class classical cultures where they talk about like Greek works and Roman works and things like this. That's classical cultures. I have taken a little bit of that. Um, obviously, as someone who has a great appreciation for comedy in particular, I even took um, the classics comedy class where I learned about, uh, you know, authors such as Aristophanes and things like this. Uh, very entertaining class. Um, just, just a lot of fun. So I, I guess, you know, even back then, Comedy was just a part of everyday life. Now, um, just going to lay some ground rules. Um, you can feel free to go look up Donna Zuckerberg yourself. Uh, but the premise of this video and um, is, is my interpretation of the book and outlining what Donna Zuckerberg is trying to prove. If what she's trying to prove is, is even relevant to the Manosphere discussion, um, if it even really matters in the grand scheme of things, we're going to define some terms and just some things. And then I'm going to go through all my, uh, my highlighted notes, um, from the book that I sort of took down. So I'm going to have all of those ready for you. We're going to basically read through all the notes that I highlighted and I'm going to comment as we go along. Just seems to be a good format that works for me. So obviously, in this regard, um, we are interested in covering as much material as possible. But before we do that, like I said, let's just go with the overall premise. I took some notes down so that um, we have the record straight. So what is Donna Zuckerberg seeking to do? Well, she seeks to prove that red pill, that is the movement within the manosphere, is hijacking Greek and Roman classics of antiquity, um, that is the era before the Middle Ages, and corrupting them for the purposes of a modern misogynistic and racist agenda built on oppressive practices that suppress all but the white man, JBW. Okay, now in terms of going through these notes and whatnot, okay, if I see logical fallacies when I'm going through these notes, I'm going to point out logical fallacies. Now, here's the thing, okay? I'm not overly interested in the classics as someone who only draws on really stoicism as a concept from this, um, this um, particular pool of knowledge um, in respect to when I talk about stoic indifference and the importance of maintaining that, um, you know, not giving away emotion and stuff like this for free, that sort of thing. So I'm going to mention classics in passing here and there. I admittedly glossed over these bits of the book because I was more interested specifically in her perception of what she thinks is fact 
about red pill as a whole. Now, when she's right, I'm going to agree with her. When she's got something wrong, I'm going to point it out. And if certain speakers within the manosphere go too far, I'm going to acknowledge it. It's as simple as that. But I think what would be a good idea when you're talking the classics um, is getting the firm definitions of probably the five main philosophies in the classics. So I've got them all pulled up here. And we're going to start with Stoicism, which has two definitions. The first definition is the one that men generally are referring to when they are talking about being Stoic as men, while the second one is the one that Donna Zuckerberg is claiming that we are hijacking for our own gain. And we'll elaborate on this. Don't worry. It's coming. The first definition of Stoicism is the endurance of pain or hardship without display of feelings and without complaint. When I talk about Stoic indifference and I talk about being Stoic, this is what I am talking about. What I am not talking about is an ancient Greek school of philosophy founded at Athens by Zeno and Sidium. The school taught that virtue, the highest good, is based on knowledge. The wise live in harmony with the divine reason, also identified with fate and providence that governs nature, and are indifferent to the vicissitudes of fortune and to pleasure and pain. So that's pretty much Stoicism in a nutshell. Second major um, philosophy in classical cultures is Platonism, which is based on the philosophy of Plato and his followers. He was the successor to Socrates. So basically, Platonism is any of the various revivals of Platonic doctrines or related ideas, especially Neoplatonism and Cambridge Platonism, a 17th century attempt to reconcile Christianity with humanism and science. It is essentially the theory that numbers or other abstract objects are objective, timeless entities, independent of the physical world and of the symbols used to represent them. Then there is Aristotelianism based on uh, Aristotle. It's a tradition inspired by the work of Aristotle, usually characterized by deductive logic and an analytic inductive method in study of nature and natural law. So basically what we do all the time as we use inductive reasoning to try to explain, you know, certain psychological behaviors around us and things like this. So we do engage in a lot of inductive reasoning because again, we don't have the studies um, because they're being done as we speak. Again, that's why you always get called pseudoscience. We're waiting for the studies to catch up. So this is definitely a um, part of it. Um, and then there's Epicureanism, or Epicureanism, rather. Sorry, I'm butchering these, man. I'm not Greek. It's an ancient school of philosophy founded in Athens by Epicurus. The school rejected determinism and advocated hedonism. That is, everything's not set in stone. Pleasure is the highest good, but of a restrained kind. Mental pleasure was regarded more highly than physical, and the ultimate pleasure was held to be freedom from anxiety and mental pain. Basically, maximize happiness and minimize pain. And then, of course, skepticism. Uh, as, you know, when we use the word, we say, um, you know, doubt as to the truth of something. But in, you know, the classics philosophy, it's the theory that certain knowledge is just impossible to know. So, again, Stoicism, Platonism. Um, Aristotelianism, Epicureanism, and skepticism. Those are mouthfuls, bro. That's what she said. <laughs> um, and that's pretty much just the philosophies I wanted to clearly define. Personally, probably the only thing I pull from this pool of um, Greek classics knowledge, personally, when I discuss red pill or manosphere content in general, is probably stoicism. And not to the degree that uh, Donna is talking about. So I'm very, very curious um, what she did and what she came up with. So I think without further ado, it's time to just deep dive into my notes of what she has to say. It is going to be broken up in the same way that it's broken up in her book. We're going to talk about my notes that I um, highlighted related to her introduction and my thoughts on that. Then we are going to talk about her thoughts on the arms of the manosphere, the various, um, 
you know, sections of the manosphere. Basically, the like the four videos I talked about, basically, with the exception of incels, she doesn't really mention those uh, too much in this book. But her thoughts on those, um, as well as groups that we wouldn't even consider manosphere, to be honest. And I'll list my reasons why that is. Um, and then we're going to talk about her section called The Angriest Stoics. Okay, so that's basically her view of the hijacking of Stoicism. The Ovid method, which is, I guess, Ovid is one of the quote-unquote original PUAs. So she talks about Ovid's work in the context of the pickup artist community. Um, again, I kind of glossed through the more Greek aspects and Roman aspects of it, but her thoughts in general as it relates to today, I was interested in that. Um, her thoughts on how men think Western civilization gets saved from the failure it currently is becoming. And then her conclusion. So I'm going to try to target all that piece by piece and uh, just give you my thoughts as we go. So without further ado, for real, for real, let's begin with uh, the introduction. Okay. So here's basically what I took down, um, highlighted from her book. So again, if you want to read the book yourself, all this stuff will be there. But I'm here to just give you my thoughts. Okay. Of course, some jerk off with a muffler or whatever has to come going down here. Hey, look at me. I got a bigger dick than everybody else. Ugh. Overcompensating. Anyway, these online communities go by many names. And already she's starting off disingenuously. The alt right, <laughs> the manosphere, men going their own way, pickup artists. And they exist under the larger umbrella of what is known as the Red Pill, a group of men connected by common resentments against women, immigrants, people of color, and the liberal elite. She actually wrote this in the book. And this book got pretty good reviews, so it just kind of tells you how indoctrinated people are. So, right out of the gate, she's lumping us in with a bunch of uh, swastika confederate flag-waving extremists. Um... So, yeah, that, that's fun, considering that also um, the Manosphere has people of all races and all backgrounds um, in it, all sharing a common experience and wanting to make change. So, obviously, if the Manosphere was an alt-right outlet, um, yeah, that, that would not be conducive to the type of diverse space that we have in the Manosphere. So already the fact that she's trying to lump the alt-right under the red pill is problematic. For sure. Okay? And yes, it is true that some people who are part of MGTOW or MRAs or PUAs or incels or any of these other groups within the manosphere as a whole, yes, some of them are alt-right and have hard right political leanings. I would say me personally, I kind of lead moderately to the right I'm mostly center, but slightly off to the right, I would say. Um, you know, and on a lot of things, I am fairly left-leaning. For example, I am pro-gay marriage. I don't think that's a big deal. I am pro-environment. I don't think preserving the earth is a bad thing. You know, there's a lot of things that, you know, I kind of look at it and I see, okay, yes, um, some things make sense on the left, and yes, some things make sense on the right, but when you go too far one way or the other, which I believe modern society has gone too far to the left. Um, when I see people go too far to the right, I'm going to turn around and say, because I've said this before in the video, traditionalism goes too far sometimes. And I turn around and I say, hey, asshole, do a 180 before you go off the deep end and then you can't come back. But um, to suggest that alt-right is just a matter of course in red pill, already disingenuous. And to say that um, they are interchangeable, again, correlation does not mean causation. Okay? Um, yeah. You know, that's like, that's like saying, hey, I'm into guns, and I'm into Xbox, and then I go shoot, shoot somebody, and then it's like, oh, he's a violent person. It's probably because of the Xbox. No. That's not how that works. And again, when you consider how diverse... This, uh, this space is. Um, again, we wouldn't be talking about trying to find solutions to the problems as much as we do if we truly hated women. Or, you know, and we definitely don't have an issue with immigrants because that's not even the point of the manosphere. We don't have an issue with race because that's not a point of the manosphere. 
Uh, but yeah, the liberal elite, the ones that have kind of played a big part in enabling the gynocentric um, order, yeah, we do have a problem with them, for sure. But of course, they like to quietly hide behind the scenes and never show their faces. Okay, we're off to a great start. Hmm. The name, adopted from the film The Matrix, encapsulates the idea that society is unfair to men, heterosexual white men in particular, and is designed to favor women. I don't understand why she is so insistent on making it specifically about white men. It is not just white men that have been disenfranchised by the current deregulated marketplace. It is the bottom 80% of men, uh, and that includes pretty much people from all walks of life. So I really don't know what the hell she's talking about. She's trying to mix two different political fronts under one. Again, wave four feminism, intersectionality. Feminism just has to get in on the race stuff. They have to get in on this other crap just to stay relevant. That's how I honestly think uh, the angle is here with, with wave four feminism. They just try so hard to stay relevant because nobody gives a shit anymore. Ladies, you've got borderline matriarchy right now. Like, fuck off. It has also created the opportunity for men with anti-feminist ideas to broadcast their views to more people than ever before and to spread conspiracy theories, lies, and misinformation, just like you're doing right now. Um... But to be honest, no, there's nothing wrong with anti-feminist ideas. I say it all the time. Feminism is a red flag right out of the gate for a long-term partner. Pump and dump, you don't really care what her beliefs are. But, um, yeah, the feminist ideas are not conducive to the stability of a long-term relationship or a family unit. Yeah, in fact, it enables single motherhood. The government becomes the daddy. It is a broken system. It doesn't work. So the fact that these uh, red pill ideas are reaching more men and preventing them from making stupid mistakes... That is not the spread of conspiracy theories, lies, and misinformation. That is literally saving lives. So again, um, very disingenuous. Social media has elevated misogyny to entirely new levels of violence and virulence. We say it. 60% of all misogynistic tweets, Twitter, that's liberal safe haven. 60% of all misogynistic tweets in there are from women. So I don't know what you're talking about when you're saying it's us white men specifically that are doing this to you. It's not... Men in general, let alone specifically guys that look like me. So I don't know what you're talking about. But, you know, your brother's a white man, so maybe you should talk to him about it. Anyway, the red pill community is by no means unique in its attraction to ancient Greece and Rome. Political and social movements have long appropriated the history, literature, and myth of the ancient world to their advantage. Yeah, you just don't care until it threatens your BS, your feminism. Then you care that it's getting appropriated. Um, here's the thing. Again, you know, other men in the manosphere, like I've seen a few people that put like Greek philosophical thinkers as their profile pics in YouTube comment sections. Again, I've seen it. Um, my thoughts on it. Listen, if you like the Greek thinkers, that's great. But um, if you if you have like some like um, some complex where you think you're the inheritors of their knowledge and it's your like duty to carry on the classical antiquity and all that shit, like again, it, it just comes off as pretentious douchebaggery, in my personal opinion. Be that as it may, however, again, the fact that you're a pretentious douchebag, like, does it change the fact if you're right or wrong about something? If you're right, you're right. If you're wrong, you're wrong. You know. Whether or not you're narcissistic or things like this is irrelevant. It's ad hominem, right? So, you know, this idea that um, that red pill is hijacking, um, you know, Greek and Roman literature on a deliberate basis and deliberately corrupting it for its own gain. Um, I'm sure such groups do exist, but again, how widespread is it? Is it as widespread as you think it is, or is it that you're just going to the spaces of the extreme extreme where you wouldn't even catch guys like me hanging out? Where guys like me would look at that and cringe like, Ugh, that's not good. That's not us. We don't claim them. Again, these are the kind of questions you have to ask. Because she did claim that she went to some red pill spaces and engaged with the space. And it's like, uh, okay, um, and... Like, did, did you go to just regular people like me? Or do you just think we're all a bunch of sexist, misogynist pigs? Because that's what she seems to think. But, yeah, again, and she just keeps going. She's, she throws out Godwin's Law here. Borrowing the symbols of these cultures as the Nazi party did in the 1940s, 
can be a powerful declaration that you are the inheritor of Western culture and civilization. She low-key just threw a Godwin's Law in there. That's another logical fallacy. I'm deliberately going to low-key, try to be sneaky about it, slip that Nazi party in there so that in your brain as the reader, psychologically, you associate Nazis with Red Pill. See that? These are techniques. Now, the men of the Red Pill have adapted this strategy for the digital age. They have turned the ancient world into a meme. An image of an ancient statue or monument becomes an endlessly replicable and malleable shorthand for projecting their ideology and sending it into the world. So what she's trying to argue here is that men essentially have taken what it is um, to be a classicist, I guess, someone who appreciates the the Greek and Roman philosophies and the classical arts and have corrupted it for their own gains. This is the picture she's trying to paint. The red pill is obviously the villain here and feminism is the knight in shining armor. That's what she's going for. They are particularly interested in the histories of Great Britain, Germany, and Russia, especially the medieval period. And they also compose and cite articles about evolutionary psychology, philosophy, biology, and economics. Yes. And we would acknowledge that evolutionary psychology um, is a relatively new field. Um, that it is still in the pseudoscience category because uh, the studies are being done. But again, we have all these men reporting in from all over, okay? And sooner or later, the studies are going to match what's being reported in. Once they actually get the data on all these men telling the stories and explaining the situations and all this stuff, again, the writing is going to be on the wall. But I guess she's just mentioning like, hey, we pull from these sources as well. They attempt to perpetuate the idea that white men are the guardians of intellectual authority, especially when such authority is perceived to be under threat from women and people of color. I don't know. Um, you know, I see I see uh, red pill content creators, um, you know, from the Hispanic community, from the black community, from the Asian community. Um, I can name different ones right off my head. Off the top of my head, I can name I can name. Um, OK, here you go. Living Life of Abundance, the dude with the friggin' savage thumbnails. Okay? Accor like, according to you, if it's all about white men dominating everything, I, I shouldn't be consuming that guy's content because, you know, I'm a racist, right? I shouldn't be looking at Chisha Zed. I shouldn't be looking at Sir Yidis. Those are black guys, right? I'm racist. JBW Supreme, right? Alt-right. Nazi swastikas. I shouldn't be watching their content, according to Donna Zuckerberg. But again, it's not about being under threat from women or non-white people. It has nothing to do with that. What the red pill is about is saying, hey, women are moving like this. Okay, body positivity, promiscuity, masculinity, and misandry. This is how they're moving. All we're telling you is that if you encounter someone like this, don't put a ring on her. It's pretty much what we're telling you. Beyond that, do what you want with the knowledge. That's it. How do you answer the question, the increase in the modern women, the decrease in the traditional women? You're a man who wants to find love with a traditional woman. Can't really do that in the Western civilization. Where do you go? None of this crap that she's talking about. Now, they claim that the ancient world, and by extension, the study of the ancient world, is under attack by the politically correct establishment and social justice warriors in U.S. classrooms. As colleges move to replace some of the dead white men of the literary canon with writers who are not dead, not white, and not men, the living white men of the red pill have appeared to self-appointed guardians and defenders of the cultural legacy of Western civilization. Again, she's trying so hard to meld the alt-right and red pill into one. When the red pill talks about intersex relations, the red pill can go beyond intersex relations, but as a general rule, it has a heavy focus on intersex relations, while the alt-right is more of a political ideology so far off to the right that the things that they believe would freaking, it would probably make you puke, some of the things that they believe. But, again, the whole point of this particular excerpt is, to, is a smear campaign. It's to smear the red pill, wipe out its credibility, plug it into the Wikipedia, link all the sentences to Donna Zuckerberg's book, and now everyone's going to think, oh, it's just another misogynist movement. I don't care. And they never dig deeper, and then they stay blue pill. And that's exactly what they want. That's exactly what they want. Now, this book is about how the men of the red pill use the literature 
and history of ancient Greece and Rome to promote patriarchal and white supremacist ideology. My goal is to lay bare the mechanics of this appropriation to show how classical antiquity informs the red pill worldview and how these men weaponize Greece and Rome in service of their agenda. They tr Again, she's trying so hard because, again, all you have to do is just say a movement is racist, even though red pill has non-white people in the movement. Again, like, do your homework, man. I have decided to focus primarily on the gender politics rather than the racial politics of red pill communities for two reasons. First, the gender politics are generally more coherent throughout the red pill. You mean it's harder to prove the racist bullshit that you're spewing right now. That's what you really mean. It's hard to prove it because it doesn't exist to the extent that you are claiming it exists. In fact, it's a whole separate thing outside the red pill that's got nothing to do with the red pill or the manosphere in general. Now, there's a shared interest in policing the sexuality and reproduction of young women, particularly young white women. I mean, keep it a buck, they've become some of the thoughtiest of the thoughtiest um, in the past 60 years. So, again, we're not interested in policing them, as in stop being promiscuous. What we are doing is holding them accountable by saying, hey, you made this choice, the consequence is you don't get a ring. That's it. That's it. The MRAs, though, they want to change the laws to try to get things to be a little more equitable, right? That's what they want to do. But again, I don't really see it as trying to police uh, female um, sexuality. But we do want to reintroduce traditionalism to the extent that it disincentivizes women and men also to a degree so that we can actually bring about a more stable family unit. So we're not asking for laws that oppress women, but we are asking, hey, there used to be social stigmas that made people behave and we need those back. It's not laws, it's social stigmas. And women hate social disapproval, so that if they could live in a world without social disapproval, they'd prefer it. And that's why they'll fight tooth and nail to keep it that way. Red pill represents a new dangerous phase of American masculinity in the internet age. What masculinity? We're struggling just to salvage what little masculinity American men have left. I don't know what you're talking about. Feminism has beaten the American man into the ground with the government as its club. As soon as a woman self-identifies online as a feminist, she is likely to find herself in a hailstorm of abusive tweets and emails from the men who frequent red pill websites. Understanding their ideology and tactics for online intimidation can help lessen the impact of that abuse. Uh, poor baby? Is it your first time on the internet? Anyone who believes in red pill, I want you to go on Twitter right now and start posting red pill tweets. See how long before you find yourself in a hailstorm of abusive tweets and emails from women who frequent feminist websites. It works both ways. My advice to you is if you want to avoid digital abuse, if we're going to call it that, just don't go on the internet at all. It's the best way to avoid it. And that's pretty much it for the introduction. So you can already tell this is going to be a pretty long video. So get comfortable, folks. Uh, don't worry, I'm going to break it up into chapters so that you can kind of pick the parts you want to read. But the whole point of this video, again, is to cover the opposition and what feminism really thinks about red pill and the manosphere in general and how it perceives us. Because you have to understand what your opposition thinks about you so that you can deconstruct it. The next part of her book is called Arms and the Manosphere. So here are my highlights from that and my thoughts on it. These men are the ones coordinating attacks to send death and R-word threats to outspoken feminists. YouTube content creators, have any of you sent out death and or R-word threats? Have any of you done that? How about any of my subscribers? If any of my subscribers are doing that, unsubscribe from my channel right now. I'm not about that life. So just obviously don't send threats. Um, but again, a few of them did that to you. Therefore, all of them do that to you. I understand the importance of generalizations. Generalizations help you kind of navigate the world around you. But when the generalizations are not true, obviously it leads in the opposite direction. Also, denying when the generalizations are true is equally as harmful. But in this case, obviously... Most men are not spending their time sending death and R-word threats. And if they are, they are subhuman. So, I would say I agree that that's wrong. They believe it is their right and duty to invade feminist spaces. 
Well, based on chameleons, I would say it's the other way around. You are invading our spaces and trying to get our spaces actively shut down. They are convinced that sexism, attitudes and behavior that foster discrimination against women and perpetuate gender-based stereotypes is really a form of enlightenment and that they are the only logical people on the internet. No, it's not about discrimination against women. It's about understanding female nature, the ooga booga, and also understanding male nature and his ooga booga, and using social norms and stigmas, the nurture, the product of environment, to tame that nature to, again, facilitate a more cohesive and stable society. And that is going to be made up of stable and cohesive family units that contribute to said society. I think a big problem, and the reason why a lot of dudes out here are killing themselves, is because they don't feel they're contributing to society in a meaningful way. Men, being solution-oriented, want to fix things. It's as simple as that. This isn't about discrimination against women. This is about, hey, you want equality. You want to make things fair in the court of law. You want to do all this? Okay, bet. Let's make it fair. Let's be fair here. But obviously, when you're so used to having the privileges of a woman and the authority of men and the responsibility of a child, I know it hurts to hear that, but when you are perceived that way by society, again, when the idea of true equality is suggested, it is seen as oppression by you. Okay? Now, since some of these men are skilled at deploying emotional abuse tactics... They succeed surprisingly often at convincing people that their worldview has a rational basis. No. Emotional abuse tactics means you don't like when I say the unflattering things that reveal your crappy behavior. You don't like that because it garners social disapproval and your ooga booga makes it so that you avoid it at all costs. That's what that means. Oh, he says that body count means no ring? That's an emotional abuse tactic. He says I'm too masculine and combative? That's an emotional abuse tactic. That's gaslighting. No, it's the truth. It's the truth. And you don't want to handle it. But other men are listening to this and they're like, you know, my ex-girlfriend pulled the same shit on me. Yeah, mine too. Yeah, my wife said the same shit. My wife cheated on me with the neighbor. I mean, we weren't talking about that topic, but yeah, it's pretty fucked up too. Yeah. And then we all come together and then we all start talking and then it's like, oh shit. And that's why the red pill spreads. It doesn't spread because of misogyny and all this dumb shit. It's because men, clueless and ignorant in their blue pill mindset, this shit's happening to them and they don't understand. And then when they realize they're not alone, they come together. Emotional abuse tactics. <laughs> United by the belief that masculine cisgendered men are discriminated against by our feminized gynocentric society and therefore they must support each other. Yes. Misandry is rampant. Hashtag kill all men. Hashtag men are trash. Men are treated as disposable. Nobody gives a shit about men. And you know, back when we were somewhat appreciated... And we were given an opportunity for a parental investment and we could build a family and have a stake in the society. We were very stoic. We grin and bared it without complaint. We absolutely did. But then now that appreciation is not even there. All you get is that men are trash. Why? Because the top 20% pumped and dumped you. Now all 100% are trash. And yet you still keep crawling back to the top 20 when they throw you a few crumbs. Disgusting. Disgrazia. Instead of seeing themselves as part of the nation's most affluent and powerful demographic, the predominantly white heterosexual men of the red pill believe they need solidarity with each other because the idea of white male supremacy is an illusion maintained to ensure they remain oppressed. I don't think white people feel oppressed. I have openly acknowledged JBW. White people have privilege. Of course we do. Absolutely. Absolutely. But this isn't about white and black. This is about men and women. And if we're talking about men and women, women are the advantaged sex in the current model. And they want matriarchy. But they claim patriarchy to dodge responsibility. Again, this woman's fixation with white men. She's trying very, very hard to force a link 
between racist alt-right movements and the red pill that men of all cultures and backgrounds discuss. In order to justify the Wikipedia article that's currently on the internet about what the manosphere is. Simple as that. She doesn't want to learn what it is. She doesn't want to learn. She wants to dye her hair purple. The vast majority of people killed in the workplace are men. Female students outnumber male students in primary, secondary, and college classes. And unlike men, women are almost never falsely accused of R-word or forced to pay child support for children over whom they have no parental rights. Mm -hmm. If the men on red pill message boards truly focused on finding solutions to these problems or understanding their complex underlying causes, I would not have written this book. That's a very disingenuous statement. She knows damn well that the problems are definitely gargantuan tasks to overcome. And we have the MRAs fighting every single day. And they are largely going ignored. The laws are not changing. So that's bullshit. Solutions are trying to be found. They're just not getting taken seriously. Because it ain't us that hold the keys to the city, so to speak. Okay. Unfortunately, instead of looking for answers, they prefer to fight the cultural narrative. You got to start somewhere. They believe that all women throughout history share distinct immutable qualities and make them promiscuous, deceitful, and manipulative. Um, so here's the thing. I don't know if I would go that far. But I would say is this. Okay? I say it all the time. There's Alduin and there's Parthenax. Alduin is nature. Parthenax is nurture. Booga booga zooga booga. All men have factory settings. All women have factory settings. And it's the product of environment that either tames or allows that nature to run wild. So they do all share some qualities, but um, to the degree that promiscuous, deceitful, manipulative, that could be more product of environment than actual ooga booga, though that's debatable. Red pill represents a new phase in online misogyny. No, red pill represents a new phase in awakening. Men are catching onto your shit and you don't like it. That's it. Its members not only mock and belittle women, they also believe that in our society, men are oppressed by women. Early red pill blogs and fora, including the currently defunct site, The Spearhead, started as places for like-minded men to discuss problems men face in the US today, false R-word allegations, father's rights, the unfairness of the dating market, Shared hatred of feminism. I mean, yes. Because these things are not there to truly be equal. If they were equal, they would change the name to humanism. But they're not going to do that because this isn't about humans. This is about women. This is about female supremacy. They want the power grab. Of course, traditional women are on our side because they're not interested in power. Sorry, it's getting a little chilly in here. I had to close the window. Okay, so now she brings up one of the first groups. Um, we just talked about what she thought of the alt-right, because she actually kind of lumps them in with the manosphere, which is insulting, to be honest. So that's my conclusion on that. Men's rights activists, though, this is a group we do talk about, aka the men trying to find the solutions to the problems instead of bitching about them. Like she just said, we were not trying to find solutions to problems and just bitching about them, maybe like a few highlights ago. Okay. MRAs. The primary goal of men's rights activists is the elimination of laws and social norms that they see as fundamentally oppressive to men. These include divorce, child support, and custody laws. Routine male circumcision, which they believe is genital mutilation, and the extension of default credibility to women who claim to have been sexually assaulted. Okay. Yep. So, yeah, obviously, we know about divorce. We know about the child support and the custody laws. Again, there were the man's activists who care about circumcision, very much so. Um, yeah. And, again, with accusations, I think the solution to that is very simple. Um, if an accusation is false, jail time. That'll dissent, that is the ultimate form of social disapproval. So then that way, if someone steps forward, it's more likely she's telling the truth. 
because she knows that if she's lying, she goes to jail. That'd be the easiest way to solve the problem. But men's rights activists prefer to be called men's human rights activists, and they think of themselves as humanists or egalitarians. I agree. Yes, because they want true equality, not this bullshit where you get all the perks of being a girl and a guy, and we call that equality. No, you can't be modern and traditional. You get one or the other. Pick a street. MRAC custody laws is overwhelmingly unfair to men because we live in a gynocentric society, while feminists see custody laws as reflecting a deeper problem of gender normativity and biological essentialism that forces women to perform the overwhelming majority of child care duties. Well, if feminists truly felt that way, then the men who actually are more fit to raise the kids and care for the kids, they would be fighting so that those men get custody. But again, all talk, no action. The factions within the red pill are often hostile to each other. Yes, and I always preach that they should be trying to work together, not against each other. So she is right about this. So between the MRAs and the pickup artist community in particular, pickup artists focus their energy on perfecting techniques for seducing women, while the men's rights movement see pickup artists as participating in and contributing to gynocentrism by placing so much value on women as sex objects, they inadvertently afford women power over men. So, um, the MRA position on this, using the action replay in Game Shark, is it going, um, is it going to the point where they are basically giving women the power? It could be argued, I suppose, but I don't think the people using the cheat code see it that way because they get boxed at the end of the day. The pickup artists see no other alternative. They look at it like, well, the system is what it is. It's gynocentric. So I'm going to find the cheat codes and get her consent and we're going to make this happen. And that's pretty much it. But the men's rights activists, they say, okay, you're already kind of starting off on the wrong foot trying to do it that way, though. It's debatable, but I think these guys probably have more in common than they do different. And if they just sat down and started talking to each other, maybe they'd get somewhere. Pickup artists, meanwhile, believe that sexual success is a key element of being a true alpha male. And they believe those in the men's rights movement channel their sexual frustration into social activism because they are unable to convince women to sleep with them. A lot of PUAs do think this way. Once they get the cheat codes, they think they're some sort of god or some shit like that. Not all of them. Of course not. Some of them are out here really helping people. I think PUA is viable for normies. I absolutely do. I don't think it's viable for sub fives. And chads don't need it. Just as women don't need it. So, I would say, um, again, it's not in good faith when you're just referring to someone as basically, uh, oh, you know, you're a prude, you're a virgin, you're a this, that, and the third. Just because an MRA has something to say about your contribution or lack thereof to solving the real problems. Because remember, PUAs want to cheat the system. MRAs want to change the system. And MGTOWs check out altogether. Now, he calls his new ideology neo-masculinity. Encompassing values not only of pickup archery, but also of traditional gender roles, male self-improvement, and libertarianism. So neo-masculinity is like a subset within the manosphere. Um, and it basically is saying that uh, it uses the old ways of helping men living in a virtuous manner while catering to the masculine side of their biological nature. It's trying to reconcile ooga booga with traditionalism. Which is something that we kind of did back in the day by taming our nature. It gives men the practical tools to receive the benefits possible with a male existence while living in natural harmony with women and improving the sustainability and value of their societies. It also provides a man with powerful mental defenses to aid in his navigation through a world that wants to reduce him to a zombified customer who serves at the altar of the corporate state. Yeah, I mean, it do feel like that sometimes, man. I don't think I can really say anything about that or refute that. I mean, it is what it is. The next group is men going their own way. Y'all know about MGTOW. Men going their own way aim to live their lives free of female influence and define manhood completely on their own terms. Over time, this aim has evolved significantly. While it initially started as a movement for self-reliant masculinity in harmony with traditional gender roles, it now advocates for living entirely separate from women and engaging in marriage strikes. Yeah. Yeah. This is what we're talking about. This is a little more in line with pretty much most members of Red Pill are saying, hey, 
oh, you want to go be the thing we don't want? Well, then don't be surprised if you don't get a ring. Simple as that. MGTOWs also talk about a woman's most attractive years with unreliable alpha males, often embodied by the generic characters Chad Thundercock and his black counterpart Tyrone before they hit the wall. We said yesterday the wall is just, put simply, it's the idea that a woman's romantic options for a relationship, not sexual options, will change when she goes from her 20s to her 30s because in their late 20s and their attractiveness begins a steady decline at which point they become more willing to settle for a beta for the purposes of a relationship because the alphas will not give her the ring. So these men in the beta category believe it is better to opt is better to commit uh, than have no woman, while MGTOWs believe it is better to opt out of the rig system altogether. Yes. Nothing new. So sometimes she gets it right. <laughs> now, almost uniformly libertarian and their distaste for big government is apparent. This led to a schism with the MRAs. Many members are which are theoretically interested in activism in the form of lobbying for changes in custody and divorce law. So again, this is the rift between MRAs and MGTOWs. MRAs believe that the system can be changed and utilized um, to, to bring about positive outcomes for men. While MGTOWs believe, as libertarians, that that is a pointless exercise because the big government can't be trusted with anything. So they're dismissive and they just they just go their own way. While pickup artists, they really have a problem with MGTOWs. They just call them virgins going their own way. But remember, MGTOWs can spin plates. They can have LTRs or they can go monk. Monk is just one of many pads. Or they can be a minimalist off the grid. Living economically friendly, sometimes called a green pill type lifestyle. Now, what she tries to argue, again, she just can't stop freaking jamming this down our throats, that they're trying to merge with the so-called alternative right or alt-right, a neo-reactionary white nationalist group that began gaining prominence in 2015 and has been steadily growing since. The alt-right comprises several competing factions, including outright neo-Nazis, such as Andrew Anglin, publisher of The Daily Storm, huh? Other less blatantly anti-Semitic members of the alt-right include Richard Spencer, the president of white nationalist think tank, the National Policy Institute, consider themselves identitarians and advocate for a white ethno-state. The alt-right might appear to be an outlier alongside the master. Gee, you don't fucking say. Since its primary focus is racial rather than gendered, we've been saying that. However, many members of the alt-right are also either pickup artists or MGTOWs. Again, correlation does not cause caus causation. Logical fallacy. Logical fallacy. Just stop. You're trying way too hard. Furthermore, the policing of white female sexuality is a major concern for all alt-right men. Again, they're off the fucking rails. They rail against the societal ills of race mixing. I don't give a shit. Fuck who you want. But when it comes to girls, JBW is JBW. While for guys, listen, we, we smash whatever. We don't care. Their vision of an ideal future for the white race cannot materialize if white women do not bear the children of white men. They have therefore adopted the term white genocide to describe the rise in interracial relationships. Look, man. JBW is going to phase out at some point. It's going to happen. So you're just going you're just going to have to live with that because everybody else is still smashing and white people are are just they're not having kids. It's just not happening. And to be honest, like, I don't really give a shit. I don't really care. I have no fealty to my skin pigment. But I think as a man, we all share a common experience to varying degrees. And I think that's more important. The relationship between men and women. Because long after any particular culture or race is gone, men and women will still be here. So that's the bigger issue for sure. Now, some of these writers, however, seem leery of explicitly allying themselves with outright white supremacists and anti-Semites, sometimes called alt-light. They focus on preserving the culture and values associated with Western civilization against threats both external, such as Muslim refugees, and internal, such as progressive intellectuals. So, here's the thing. For a Western civilization... 
Islam and Muslim civilizations may seem too traditional, too far off, but for them, in the Eastern world, it works just fine for them, and their system is fairly based. It works for them. I could see why it wouldn't work in the West. Um, you know, not without lots and lots of um, resistance. But um, for the East, it works for them. So I think those two systems can coexist in the world. It's just that uh, probably better that they don't mix. It is what it is. Um, but on internally progressive intellectuals, yes, they're trying to replace patriarchy with matriarchy. And that's going to lead to a fall of Rome scenario. Again, because when a society is weakened, another society will move in and take shit over. And that's just how it goes, man. That's ooga booga. That's nature. If there's a chink in the armor, they're going to attack. Simple as that. So, again, this idea of traditionalism and preserving masculinity and the things that make men great as men. Um, yeah. You want that. And what's funny is you say it's toxic, you say it's trash, and then you quietly go bang those very men behind closed doors. It's very hypocritical. These disparate units of the red pill are, however, united by a common enemy, social justice warriors. So yes, probably the old right and the red pill both hate social justice warriors. But I will tell you that they probably hate them for very, very different reasons. Very, very different reasons. I think the alt right probably has much more racially motivated reasons. Yes. While the manosphere is more interested in the fact that, yo, women are going off the freaking rails here. And if they want to be with traditional men, if that's what they want, then they need to themselves become traditional or they will fail. Simple as that. We're not going to go in and impose our way. We're not going to do that. But we are going to hold you accountable by not giving you what you want if you don't give us what we want. Simple as that. Social justice warriors believe in an extreme left-wing ideology that combines feminism, progressivism, and political correctness into a totalitarian system that attempts to censor speech and promote fringe lifestyles while actively discriminating against men, particularly white. Obviously, she's saying this in a very mocking way. Because based on her language, it's very obvious who she thinks her enemies are. But um, she's not wrong. That's exactly what it is. Social justice warriors want to make laws based on feelings. They want to make laws that favor women over men. They want to make laws that are like, yay, at least we made some progress, when really it's regressivism. And then they want to be politically correct. We don't want to step on China's toes. We don't want to offend anybody. Mm. Doesn't help anyone. Doesn't help anyone. Okay. So that's pretty much it for that. It is to the legendary first census that there must also be traced the origins of the term classics. In Servius's scheme, the men in the top of his six classes, the men with the most money and property, were called the classici. The top men were classics, and this is why by the time of the late second century AD Roman, Miscellanus Aulus Gellius, by metaphorical extension, the top authors could be called classic authors. Scriptoris classici, to distinguish them from the inferior, metaphorically proletarian authors, Scriptoris proletari. Being well-versed in the classics is almost by definition a signifier of high social class. Notice how because she studied the classics, she's trying to low-key here say that she's better. She's not saying it directly, but again, I ain't stupid. All right? Because she says that she's a classicist, and now she's saying being well-versed in the classics is almost by definition a signifier of high social status. Again, she's probably trying to do like an argument from authority or like I have the authority to argue. You don't. Hall recounts anecdotes of middle-class British men during the 18th and 19th centuries, painstakingly educating themselves in Greek and Latin in order to find greater professional success. Knowledge of the classics is used in these narratives to reinforce existing hierarchies. This is true. Again, whatever the times demand, there is something that will heighten your social status. Back then, it was being knowledgeable in the classics. Now, it's how many followers you have on Instagram. There's always something that dictates your um your status for sure now from this perspective the far right attraction to the classical tradition is logical because apparently if you are if you have commanded the classics it 
what feeds into your narcissism and makes you think you're better than everybody is that what she's getting at that the alt-right thinks that perhaps they do but that does not represent the red pill community which she thinks it does she thinks the red pill community are usually white men who believe that white men are being oppressed no the red pill community believes that men are being discriminated against men are too powerful to be oppressed you can't keep us down but when they look back to the dead white men of the ancient world as the sources of ultimate wisdom, the takeaway is that white men are better. Again, an alt-right person might think this, but a red pill man does not think this generally. So I don't know where you're getting the information from. Could it be you're trying really, really hard to make alt-right and red pill synonymous? Maybe that's what it is. The alt-right celebrates the greatness of our ancestors and the glory of our historical achievements. Rejecting revisionist arguments by modern social scientists, which portray whites as having wrought evil on the planet, we view whites as the creators and maintainers of Western civilization. Look, when teaching history, I believe in teaching the full picture, okay? So if people did both good things and bad things, you teach both. You don't erase one, put one up. You don't try to change the narrative. You just say, look, here's all the good stuff they did. Here's all the fucked up stuff they did. You be the judge. And leave it at that. It's in the past anyway. There's nothing you can do about it. It would fall firmly into the bucket, things you can't control. Now, the men of the red pill are particularly attracted to the ancient world because they see it in it a reflection of their own reactionary gender politics. And an example of this is NAWALT, which stands for not all women are like that. NAWALT is a signifier for men who have not fully swallowed the red pill and insist that there exists in the world exceptional, extraordinary women who do not share the negative traits the red pill community usually attributes to all women. Again, NAWALT is true to the degree of product of environment, but to the degree of nature, ooga booga, factory settings, AWALT. All women have the same factory settings. All men have the same factory settings. But Nawalt and Nawalt to the degree of product of environment, nurture. That is what makes us different, while our nature is what makes us the same. Never forget that. The discourse in the red pill community concerning the phrase, not all women are like that, resembles the feminist critique of the phrase, not all men, which entered the vernacular of feminists active online in mid-2014. Not all men signifies a common male response to discussions about systemic sexism in which a man insists that he is not personally sexist and therefore is not part of the problem. Well, by definition, if you're not contributing to the problem, then you're not part of the problem. Honestly, the problem that we talk about in the red pill, if you're a traditional woman, I don't think that you're part of the problem. I think you're part of the solution. So if a man is not out here being freaking sexist and misogynist and all this shit, yeah, he's probably not part of the problem. One word often used in this context is centering, that is redefining the central issue or perspective in a discussion. Yeah, like she's been doing for this whole book so far, uh, by recentering uh, Red Pill as alt-right, for example. Not all women are like that, and not all men both acknowledge the existence of sexist discourse. Correct, sexist discourse does exist, but nature is sexist too. You can't defy nature. Although the former explicitly validates sexism, while the latter ostensibly portrays a sympathy for feminism. But both rhetorical strategies use an appeal to exceptionalism to avoid explicit participation in sexist structures. And listen, exceptionalism is valid, anomalies are real, but they do not redefine the rule. That's the only thing we're going to say. AWALT, a programmatic declaration of universal female behavioral characteristics that underlies much of their ideology. Ooga booga. Nature. Can't defy it. Everyone's got factory settings. It is what it is. Take it up with Charles Darwin. Phrases such as, all women are like that, posit a sameness among women that erases specificity. The specificity is in the nurture, the product of the environment, not the nature. Because female nature is essentially the same between all women in all periods of time from ancient Greece and Rome to today, which is true. Okay. To marry or not to marry, an ancient perspective. The poster uses an excerpt from Works and Days to show that marriage is a damned if you do, damned if you don't kind of arrangement. He prefaces his claim by saying, I am a classicist by training, PhD, the whole nine yards. The Greeks and Romans were red pill in the extreme. Okay. 
So one guy says it, therefore all guys look at Greek and Roman books all the time. Got it. In his most famous fragment, the seventh, he lists ten different types of women, compares them to animals, and explains why nine of them are awful. The horse woman spends too much time grooming herself. The sea woman is unpredictable. The pig woman is filthy and obese. And then there's the donkey woman. She's hard-headed and obstinate, and will barely do her work even after you threaten and force her. And even then, she won't finish. She stays at home and eats all day and all night. And she's just as greedy when it comes to sex. She'll take any man she sees. Only the bee woman who industriously tends to her home will make a good and useful wife. But the narrator warns that even wives who initially seem virtuous are likely hiding their vices, turning their husbands into cuckolds and laughingstocks. Okay, let's let's unpack this really, really quick. So, the horse woman spends too much time grooming herself. Stacy, done. The sea woman is unpredictable. Yeah, she's probably a psycho. That's probably what that means. The pig woman is filthy and obese, body positive. Yep. Then there's the donkey woman. She's hard-headed and obstinate. Yeah, she's the masculine boss babe. We don't want her. Okay? And she's just as greedy when it comes to sex and all that. Yep, she's promiscuous. We don't want that either. Only the bee woman will make a good wife, but the narrator warns that even wives who seem initially virtuous are hiding their vices. Chameleons. Bait and switch. We never hide this from people. We openly talk about this stuff. Okay? And if you're not careful, you will get cucked, and all your boys are going to laugh at you for being a fucking idiot. She's a woman to me! And all your boys are laughing at you like, you're fucking dumb. Idiot. But it's okay. We're your boys, and we're going to help you now. We're going to help you get over it. After we're done laughing at you. <laughs> now, a pattern of familiar language for complaining about wives without ever considering how wives feel about being objects of exchange between their husbands and fathers. Um, Listen dowries were a thing what do you want me to do turn the clocks back and make it like it never existed it is what it is we don't really do dowries anymore we don't do that so okay you got that victory like there you go this anti-marriage sentiment finds its clearest echoes in men going their own way faction of the manosphere and some in this movement have taken notice yes feminism you should be paying attention because you're not going to get the men you want as a result of this. Again, you say, oh, a bunch of men going their own way. At first, they treated it like a joke. They were like, oh, you know, these aren't men that we want anyway. These are emstos. We sent them their own way. We don't want them. But then as more and more men were becoming MGTOW and going their own way and whatever, when then women were like, oh, shit. Now we got to take it seriously. And then in 2018, Don Zuckerberg writes a fucking book. This is what happens. Okay. Now, the complementary strengths of men and women make men better suited to work outside the home and women better suited to work within it. Yes, men are physically stronger. It is what it is. He convinces her to see herself as the general of the house's army. He also convinces her that no wife is more attractive to her husband than a good housekeeper. Correct. We want you to be our peace. That's what that all means. Now, he's saying essentially... From sleeping around, riding the CC, to hamstering, rationalization hamster, and hypergamy, it was all there. Of course, although there is much misogyny to be found in the literature and history of classical antiquity, not all dead men were like that. Of course. Not everyone is going to have these, um, these traditionalist ideals. Some of them are going to have progressive leanings that, again, are not conducive to a strong family unit. Whether you want to admit that or not, not our problem. Some even have what might generously be described as proto-feminist leanings. But there is no denying that producing feminist readings and uses of the classics can be a bit like trying to use a normal pair of scissors when you are left-handed. They were designed with somebody else in mind, and some people, a few in the red pill, a few in academia, even believe that feminist classics is impossible, and that feminism and interest in the ancient world are natural enemies. Perhaps. Again. What you perceive as misogyny, we just look at it like, yo, it's traditionalism. And again, you can say, hey, men, you're misogynists. Um, kill all of you. You're all trash. Um, we're going to sleep with the top 20% chads and Tyrones and ignore you. Um, and we're going to be masculine boss babes focusing on our career. And we're going to be body positive, And you're going to have to accept this. And men are saying, no, we don't. And you don't get a ring. That's all we're saying. We're not trying to force you to change. At least like a rational person in the red pill space is not trying to get you to change. They're just pointing out the flaws and they're saying, hey, you want a husband? Uh, don't do this shit. 
Next, she talks about the Red Pill Toolbox. So, the first of these is based on a concept used often by pickup artists called frame theory. Frame is a subject's perspective on the world, themselves, and any situation they encounter. I would consider my terminology for this to be maybe stoic indifference. Do not give an emotional response. Be outcome independent as well. Soap. A pickup artist might have the frame that he is an important and valued man in his community, and therefore any woman would be fortunate to sleep with him. Confidence is never a bad thing. Arrogance can um, fuck you up, though. Pride goeth before the fall. His task then becomes maintaining frame or frame control and interactions with beautiful women and ideally influencing them so their frames become assimilated to his. So, of course, right, she wants to call it gaslighting. It's not gaslighting. Okay? Men, they got educated about female nature and they're using the cheat codes, okay, to attract and seduce women with game. It's no secret that men need to have game to attract women, but women do not require game to attract men because men's desire for women is implicit. But of course, when a man tries to game women, of course, the feminist is going to look at it as gaslighting, an emotional abuse tactic in which one person tries to convince another that they cannot trust their memories and perception. There's that word again, the emotional abuse tactics. Again, when you un when you reveal the unflattering realities, they're going to say that you're emotionally abusive. They're going to say that you're gaslighting. They're going to say that you're doing things like this. When in reality, that's exactly what they're doing to you in that moment without even realizing it. Frame control is essentially a form of gaslighting. The goal is to convince someone that your version of reality is more accurate than theirs. Again, maybe the guy is just so damn confident that she was like, yo, what's that about? I'm just saying. When feminists attempt to debate their differences rationally, that's how that's what they claim. They claim it's rational. With pickup artists, MGTOWs, MRAs, or members of the alt-right, they are met with gaslighting. So they're claiming that basically all red pill men use gaslighting as a tactic when engaging with women with um with the red pill. Honestly, as someone who's been in a lot of YouTube comment sections, whenever I encounter women who disagree with me, there's a lot of gaslighting and logical fallacies and shaming tactics, a lot of sign language. So again, I don't know what she's talking about. Stoic indifference, outcome independence, amused mastery, and positive masculinity. Bob and weave, stay on point, make the point. That's always been my mantra. Many of them, as I will argue in the next chapter, also claim to be stoic and believe that they are in control of their rage, while those who disagree with them are angry, rabid feminists. Um, again, a lot of these feminists are angry and rabid because they were sold on a bullshit lie and they have not been unplugged yet. They're still in the blue pill space and they don't realize that being a traditional woman, what the feminism told them not to be, is what would have got them the husband that they wanted. But they listened to some dumb college professor with pink hair and thick framed glasses who told them another story, they bought the story, and they paid the price. No ring. No family to call their own. And if they do have a kid, it's a Chad cream pie. Congratulations, you made it. But yeah, we're misogynists, right? We're trying to oppress you. You did it to yourself. Take responsibility. The appropriative bait and switch. This technique borrows the language of systemic oppression from social justice movements while intentionally introducing confusion about who precisely is being oppressed. Modern misandry masking itself as feminism, without equal, the most hypocritical ideology in the world today. Men have been killed due to feminism. Children and fathers have been forcibly separated for financial gain via feminism. Slavery has returned to the West via feminism. With all these misandric laws, one can fairly say that misandry is the new Jim Crow. When the men of the manosphere claim that forcing fathers to pay child support is the new Jim Crow and ignore the fact that the new Jim Crow is already a term used to talk about a mass incarceration of black men, they appropriate to disastrous effect a topic that is about race and the legacy of slavery and use it to support an ideology that allows white men to restrict women's reproductive freedom by limiting access to abortion and birth control. Again, this is gaslighting. If I ever heard of gaslighting, are you kidding me? Granted, 
The concession I will give you, Donna, is this. The concession I'm going to give here is that comparing it to slavery and Jim Crow laws is in very poor taste. I will give you that. But do you think that that invalidates the fact that the family court laws and all this are unfairly stacked against men to the point where logic is thrown out the fucking window? See the film Divorce Corp. Again, is disingenuous. It's disingenuous to just sweep that under the rug because a man who wrote this um, used poor choice of words. Poor choice of words does not invalidate the argument. Again, we always say stoic indifference. Try not to inject your emotions into things if you can help it. But um, yeah, at the end of the day, if you even if you remove all the Jim Crow stuff from it, it doesn't it doesn't change the fact that yeah, by and large, the deck is stacked against men in a lot of respects, especially if he is an unattractive man. He is not top twenty. Now, another related tool is their misuse of the language of scholarly interpretation. One word that comes up frequently on the Red Pill websites is narrative, liberal narrative, the multiculturalist narrative, and the establishment's narrative. These sound like terminologies that would be in the alt-right, not in the Red Pill. Probably the only narrative that would be talked about in the Red Pill is the feminist narrative, if any. But as so often in the Red Pill, a coined phrase or term takes the place of an actual interpretation. What precisely the narrative is, or how narrative as a concept is useful, never gets defined. So again, no. The narrative is very easy to define. The narrative is that 80% of divorces are initiated by women. 50% end in divorce. Men lose 90% of the custody battles. They pay out 97% of the alimony. Men kill themselves four times as much as women. The narrative is very clearly defined. Okay, in the red pill. It's very clearly defined. And the way we see it, um, your narrative seems to come off as, hey, instead of acknowledging that you've got problems too, uh, just fuck your problems. We're going to focus on just women's problems. The thing is this, though. In the red pill, we already acknowledge female problems, and we do take them seriously. We do take them seriously. But the problem is, Nobody takes our problems seriously, so we have to take them seriously ourselves. But that would require taking time away from focusing on your problems, which you're already focused on, and that pisses you off because the attention's being taken off of you. So as you can see, it's very easy to define what the picture is, what the narrative is. It's not exactly difficult to understand, okay? And the final item in the red pill toolbox, allegedly... Um, is false equivalence. So she wants to say that we do apples to oranges. This tactic can take several forms, but the most commonly seen form on the Red Pill sites is feminist concern A may be bad, but is it similar to Red Pill concern B that feminists are apathetic about? Again, here's the thing. I do not think that, um, that that's a good argument, so I will concede this one as well. Again, acknowledge the female's problem and acknowledge the male's problem. Acknowledge both. But, unfortunately, feminists are apathetic about a lot of men's problems. Because if they weren't, they would be helping us. But they are not helping us. They are interested in furthering their own ends and nothing more. So, feminists being labeled hypocrites for fighting against R-word culture, but not caring sufficiently about false R-word allegations or prison R-word or the use of sexual assault by ISIS or some other marginally related issue, that kind of lends credence to some sort of hypocrisy. To a degree, I agree. Because again, I say this, men do take female problems seriously, okay? But if you're going to come forth with an allegation, there should be consequences if it is false and proven false. Simple as that. If the evidence proves false, then, okay, you go to jail. But if the evidence shows that it actually did happen, then they go to jail. But the point is, if you're going to drag someone's reputation through the mud, you better be telling the truth. Okay? Now, all these tactics will appear throughout the book. The very same tactics she's using, by the way. But, 
both in how red pill websites approach contemporary issues and in their analysis of the ancient world. Now, here's the thing. I just unpacked a lot. Okay. That was an hour and 15 minutes. There is still the angriest Stoics, the Ovid method, how to save the West and the conclusion. Um, I'm thinking that stuff might not take as long. We will see. But I think for now, I'm going to stick a pin in it. Otherwise, I risk this video going too long. So we'll stick a pin in it for today. Okay. We're going to pick up tomorrow with um, how allegedly the red pill hijacked stoicism and other classical philosophies to further their own gains. We're going to talk about how pickup artists used Greek and Roman um, readings to justify some of their questionable behaviors when operating in the PUA space. Then we're going to talk about how men in the red pill space think that Western civilization can be saved, their solutions to the problem, and are they too extreme or not? You'll be surprised on what I agree and disagree with. And then we'll just kind of talk about her overall conclusions and why I think they are not entirely right and mostly wrong. And then I think we'll call it a day. So it might be a two-parter. It might be a three-parter. I'm not sure. But there's no way I can do this all in one video. There's no way. If it was a live stream, maybe a different story, but I, I tend to not do those. So how about for now, we call it a night. Feel free to leave a like. Feel free to leave a dislike. Call me an asshole. You disagree with what I just said. Fine. If you like what you're hearing, though, feel free to subscribe. If you think I'm falling off, unsubscribe. Whatever you do, don't report the video, though. Again, part of operating this space is also acknowledging your opposition, dissecting it, taking it apart, and... Um, understanding it so that you know how to address it when you're faced with the opposition. Because again, in the red pill space, we really do believe we're trying to bring back positive masculinity. We want to bring that back. We know traditionalism tames the unflattering realities of both male and female nature to bring about a better society for both men and women. But in order to do that, we have to be willing to defend what we stand for, because if we're not willing to defend it, then what's it really worth? I have been that guy, Pete. You refuse to invite to gatherings. And I will definitely see you tomorrow for part two of the dissecting of this book, Not All Dead White Men by Donna Zuckerberg. Until then, later.